Hello. So as I say at the beginning of this particular podcast every year, so now the end is near. So we face the final. No, God's sake. Why would I do that? I'd never, ever do that. A cliched start to the pod. That could have been awful. That it's a dark and stormy night of Endgame podcast opening. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to say we're back for the penultimate podcast of this season. We're recording during this Liverpool Southampton game on Tuesday night that barely anyone cares about because of the mass rotation there. And, and sorry, the schedule has been a bit messed up the last few weeks. It's been um, quite bad due to work reasons, basically on my side, as best we can do. Joined for the penultimate time this season in his stint as co-host, at least, by Harry. You're right, mate. How's it going? Good, thank you. Halfway through the second last game week, I know it's, we were going to get to this stage in the season eventually, but it feels like I never thought I'd be saying we're going and we're reviewing game week 38. Just one week left. I know a lot of people are very happy that the season is finally drawing, <laughs> finally drawing to a close. I have enjoyed the past five game weeks quite a lot. Um, it's gone very well for me as we'll go through with the game week reviews, but it has been a long slog. Um, I do look forward to a little bit of time off over probably about a month period before the game launches likely at the end of June yeah um, but hopefully a nice little few weeks to have a break and yeah switch off for a little bit for the penultimate time again for me whether you have me back on we'll wait and see but we are who got the assist you can find Tom at WGTA underscore FPL you can find me at FPL underscore Harry Today will be, again, not much else to do apart from focus on game week 38. We'll have a look at what's happened in season past, how many goals there tend to be, do we go for teams who've got stuff to play for, that sort of stuff. Basically a review of how we should be focusing on game week 38, looking at the fixtures and also what's happened. First up, of course, game week reviews, mini league update and the market forces as well. Cool. Right. Let's kick off with the game route reviews. So, Harry, an abject collapse, apathy all around, a total disaster class. No, I'm not talking about Arsenal's abject failure against Spurs and Arsenal. I'm talking about my FPL season. And um, th this game week is no different, or it has been no different so far. I'm on 39 points, two of those of uh, Martinelli and Laporte off the bench. Um, come back to that in a second. But uh, Salah, who was injured, uh, meant that Son was always coming in. So, you know, I just thought I'd just destroy him basically for everybody else. And I had the 50 50 week this week, Harry, um, for the other player I was going to bring in. And I was speaking to my friend, Libero FPL on Saturday, and I had two choices for the midfielder I was going to bring in. And I thought, you know what, everyone's going to captain Richarlison. So I'm going to be captain this midfielder that I bring in. I had two choices, Harry. I had Wilfred Zaha and I had James Madison. And I thought I'd captain, as I said, whoever I bring in as a differential captain. And when it came down to it, who do you think I brought in, Harry? Oh, no. Oh, no. It's going to be Zaha, isn't it? <laughs> well, it was indeed. Yes, I went with Wilfred Zaha. So, um, yeah, hopefully he will do what Madison did against Watford's um, against uh, against Everton. Uh, but, yeah, another 50-50, which hasn't gone my way. And uh, to top it all off as well, Guess who? I still got Laporte and I've got Martinelli coming off the bench with one point. Guess who sat third bench with six points, Harry? It's Jao Pedro. <laughs> Honestly, that guy, it's just those things. Him and Puki getting nothing in double in game week 36 when we all needed the pair of them. And then they both score in game week 37. Just like sums up this season for so many people. I know. I know. I, I love the podcast. and love doing it. But yeah, this season in general, it's really, I've just, I've had enough of it, I'm afraid. I mean, I've got, to, I've got to just be honest about it. It's, it's Dostoevsky-esque how these split decisions just slap me in the face every time. And we'll discuss it more next week in the final pod when I do my season post-mortem, which seems to be an annual event now. Um, and after that, I'm sure, Harry, you'll be very pleased to be out of here because I'm sure I'll just be ranting and raving for a good 20 minutes. <laughs> um, so you're on free hit, and I'm assuming, especially after Liverpool um, rotated heavily tonight and loads of other things going your way, that you're on a, a good roll today. Yeah, so I join you on a captaincy fail um, as I captain Danny Ings on my free hit. But mm. as part of my free hit, I backed against pretty much every top side. So I only had Son. So I pretty much backed against Spurs because he was over 100%. Kane's ownership was high. I had no Man City as well. I had no Liverpool. I had no Arsenal. And practically everything that has gone my way has gone my way. Um, yeah, so it's looking pretty good. I think I'm on 62 points. I've still got, in theory, 10 left to play, plus my captain, Ing. So 11 left to play. The only things that can really damage my rank now are Chelsea defence, so what James and Alonso do, because I did take them out on free hit. But with sort of 
11 in theory still to play. I'm hoping for another boost come Thursday evening up to about 1.8K now. So hoping for an amazing last couple of weeks. What could happen? I don't know, but I'm just being actually, I think since being on the pod, it's been, brought me a lot of good luck. So maybe I'll stay on for next season. Uh, if you could just give me some of that while you leave, that would be fantastic. Um, but yeah, no, um, a very, very good progress after initially, when you first came on, you were like, oh God, the curse has got me already. You might be probably the first co-host that's actually done better since being on the podcast. And I hope that it's me next year, but it's more than likely going to be Lucy doing very well and me, as usual, licking her boots. Right, mini league update we normally get on to about now. Um, I'm not going to do it this week, actually, just to build the tension a little bit as we head towards uh, the, the final week. I do know that erstwhile leader Hakon Mangersnes has been dethroned. Um, he was le- he's been leading for I think the last 10, 11 game weeks, something like that. But he's now down in third. And Brett Taylor, I love Lamptey, who's been in around the top 10 for eons, it feels like, has the top spot. Last time I checked, I think it was top by about 20 points, something like that. And Joking then were off another veteran of the top five or top 10 in the mini league is right in there amongst it as well. But I think there's three of them who are kind of split by about 30 points or so. I mean, maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but we will see how the rest of this double game week pans out. I know there's a few chips in play, for example. Uh, there's a free hit um, being used by a few of them. So things could change. It'd be, it'd be very interesting to see how that one backs up. And as we've mentioned, we are recording on Tuesday. So it's quite difficult to be making any real assumptions surrounding the market forces. But nonetheless, there are a few dribs and drabs, aren't there, Harry, of people making moves, especially a man we're going to speak about probably a little bit. Yeah, so basically the market forces comes down to people wanting to sell one of three players. Third most sold is Van Dijk, currently with an orange flag. Again, him and his teammate, the most sold player, Mo Salah, with 120,000 transfers out now, doubled more than any other player. Dennis, again, second in there. So sort of three players with yellow flags are the key players that people are selling. And then there's a wide variety of players that are being transferred in sort of all the way through the top 10. People are trying to find those one-week punts A lot of them have done points recently. So we see Jared Poen coming out on top, sort of the number one sort of joint up there with Son and De Bruyne all in around that sort of 50K transferred in mark. People moving Salah on and going for one of these three as their final game week punt. I like all three of them. De Bruyne, my only concern was he played a bit deeper in the past couple of games. I expect him to be back further forward, but that was not quite what managers wanted to see. Son, again, I think will probably be the player we talk about and will likely be the most captain player this week, depending on Salah news. And then Bowen's just been going about his business. He hasn't had a double or anything like that for the past. You know, he didn't have a double in 36 or 34. So we kind of ignored West Ham, but he has been, you know, scoring points quite consistently this season as we've had joy with him in the past. And he is number one at the moment. Yeah, makes a lot of sense indeed. Um, as you mentioned, um, Son and Luis Diaz as well being brought in by some people. Got a question on him later. And in terms of replacing that Van Dyke, it looks like Reese James is where people are going at the moment. 17,000 transfers in for him. He's the highest uh, transferred in defender, followed by the likes of Matip and Dyer. But a long way to go in the double game week yet. So we shall see. And plus, a lot of people kind of uh, getting their free hit, their normal team back after free hitting um, and having decisions to make. Um, but hey there we go ahead of the final game week and it is all about the final game week this week it's a really interesting one just because I mean game week 38 historically has been I guess uh, plagued with loads of questions people assume that there's loads of goals scored on the final day versus kind of the average and I suppose I did a little bit of research I've done this long term listeners remember that I've done this for the last couple of years so it's a bit more of an update for you just a bit of a refresher for those people but newer listeners this will be all new to you but the key question, are there more goals on the game week 38 in general? Uh, the answer is yes, um, actually. Um, so over the last seven seasons, on average, um, there are 33.4 goals scored and 19.9, 20, if you will, are home goals, 14 of them being away goals, and an average of about four and a half clean sheets, so five clean sheets. Um, with the help of FPL Review last season, we came up with an average of about 28 goals per game week as an average amount of goals scored and five clean sheets so that gives you kind of around kind of a 20 percent uplift in terms of goal score on game week 38 versus your average game week of the season clean sheets is about the same so five each way um but basically you know expect five more home goals and a couple more away goals throughout the course of game week 38 
basically. Um, and last year was quite an interesting one because it was the first game week in God knows how long that fans were actually be welcomed into the stadiums um, after a long absence. Um, and last season, 31 goals were scored um, just to kind of start our walk down memory lane so we want people to remember. 21 goals were scored at home. 10 of them were away. Notables for, from last season, Kane did, did what he always does against Leicester. Um, he scored a goal and an assist um, away to them, beat them 4-2. Bale got a brace in that game, old Gareth Bale. Chelsea lost 2-1 away to Aston Villa, didn't they, Harry? But still managed to somehow squirm their way into the Champions I League. I remember watching that and thinking, I'm hating this. But luckily, the other result in that Spurs game secured us going into top four as did the the Newcastle game on Monday night secured us but I think we best not talk about that one. Oh, it's okay it's fine I'm, I'm used to it I'm an Arsenal fan and also yeah hey whatever <laughs> but yeah um that um I mean, we spoke about Leicester we spoke about Leicester actually didn't we as, as part of that kind of chokers and section a long time ago and that was what facilitated you hitting the Champions League last year but yeah about two one loss away uh to Villa um, did no molester you hit for because Leicester lost to Spurs. The big game was the 5 0 demolition of Everton by Man City at home. Canaguero, it was his final game. Um, he scored a brace in that. I captained him as well for that. I think I got 78 or something like that last season. I remember, I think it was Sue Fowl got 10 points for me, and I was ecstatic about that. And Joe Willock uh, got an eight pointer. And so I, had, my- I had Edison in that game. And he saved a penalty on the final day of the season Ooh, and kept nice. clean sheet, max bonus points. People ask me, you know, what's the highlight of your season? I go, Edison in game week 38. And people think, what on earth happened there? And then <laughs> I have to remind them that he saved a penalty. Mm. The Vaughan to penalty save. But what was that, like 18 points or something ridiculous? If that happens. Yeah, I think he got like 17 with save points as well. <laughs> oh, that's, that's lovely, isn't it? I've, mm. Young older listeners will remember Hilario Gomez uh, when he used to play for Watford, saving two penalties on game week 37 a few years back. <laughs> That's an absolute massive haul. I think it was like 24 he got for that. Um, but yes, uh, uh, the, the penalty save in the clean sheet. Chef's kiss. So yeah, uh, 2019 20, um, fun stuff there. So a couple of years back now, this was in lockdown. Uh, KDB scored a brace. This was the KDB sort of breakout season where he absolutely smashed it, only cost 9.5. A city demolished Norwich, 5 0 at home, surprisingly. Um, Jesse Lingard scored his first goal of the season in the 99th minute versus Leicester for Manchester United. <laughs> that was his only goal of the season. That was the last goal of the season, which was also his first goal of the season, which is quite funny. And, and Bruno Fernandes, I've written here, of course, scored the pen. So it was back in the Fernandes days. And a heavily rotated Liverpool. So no Trent, no Salah, as we saw uh, this evening, uh, beat Newcastle 3-1. Um, so yeah, that was a couple of years ago. But I still remember it from fairly well. I remember I captained Jesus that week because I remember his kind of expected goal involvement was pretty good. And I was kind of chasing a little bit. When am I not? Let's be honest. Um, but KDB, that was the season just to also captain KDB over Salah and it paid dividends for those people who went for it. Yeah, the Jesse Lingard one is, I remember someone had a bet on it that he didn't score a single goal all Premier League season and that's what <laughs> lost it for him. And he had a, a ridiculous amount of payout if it came on and he scored in the 93rd minute of the final game of the season. Or something yeah, like 90, like 99th minute it was. I looked up <laughs> unbelievable. Earlier that's, that's, that's unbelievable, isn't it? Um, Yes, yes. God, that must that must have really hurt, mustn't it? Reminds me of that Chris. I think it was the year before the Chris Smalling own goal. Remember, they had a game that was called off due, due to a bomb scare. I think it was against Bournemouth, and then they replayed it on the Tuesday, and they won three one. But Chris Smalling scored an own goal in that game, and he was quite well owned then. So you had loads of people like losing mini leagues and all sorts of palaver just off the pack of those like last minute own goals and something like that. So these sort of things can happen in this whole FPL business. Um, further back, 2018-19, um, a couple of games to pick out for you. Uh, Crystal Palace 5, Bournemouth 3. So it's the, the exemplar of the high scoring final day fixture. A brace for Chelsea man. Batshuayi <laughs> and uh, Patrick Van Anholt, who used to be an absolute final day musto, scoring his customary goal that day. And elsewhere, Cardiff beat United 2-0 at Old Trafford, relegated Cardiff. Nelson Mendes Lang made himself into a Bluebirds legend. Uh, 36 goals were scored that year, um, so a very high scoring uh, final day indeed. 
And a few other kind of just, I'm not going to go all the way back, obviously, uh, but a few other things to mention that people may remember if you've been playing for as long as we have, or at least I have. Uh, Simpson 18, Spurs 5, Leicester 4, Varez's last game together, um, and uh, Harry Kane and Lamella, of all people, braced for Spurs. And Jose Perez braced for Rafa Benitez Newcastle. They beat Chelsea 3 0 at St. James's Park, but only 31 goals scored that year. And finally, in 2016 17, one that I have thrown in just for, just for the moment here. Um, it's not because Josh Harrop scored a brace against Palace on his debut for United. It's because Spurs beat Hull, who had been recently relegated 7 1, with Kane nesting a hat trick and Ben Davis smashing in a goal, too. Son only got an assist in that game. And Chelsea beat Sunderland 5 1 featuring Brace for Batshuayi at his actual club. Um, and that had 37 goals, the most we've ever seen, mostly due to that um, Spurs thrashing of hole 7-1. So I guess many people are going to be hoping that that's the repeat of this uh, game week looking at the fixtures. Yeah. Um, okay. So lots of randomness on the final day, but there's lots of goals. Um, and yeah. I think obviously there's a high variance in a single game week, especially, you know, with more goals on the table historically um, on the final day. I mean, maybe we may also see an outlier. We may well see, you know, that there's 10 clean sheets this game week and it's all kind of one-sided games. But as I said, you're looking at about 20% more goals than normal and average about five more home goals and a couple more away goals. I mean, Harry, looking at kind of the fixture list in front of you, what what kind of springs to mind in terms of the picture, the, the, the teams that you will be kind of looking at homing in on if you were looking to um, make some changes in your team? Yeah, I think... I, I go back and as you said, there's plenty, often more goals in the average game week. And if you add that to some of the fixtures that we've got here, I think there's definitely potential to be a heightened amount of goals this week. If this was a traditional game week, middle of the season, I'd probably say looking at the fixtures that there is a good chance of there being a fair amount of goals in this plus the final day of the season. Maybe there are slightly less teams that have got something to play for now than maybe we expected going into the final day, which may throw things off a little bit. Things depend what happens on Thursday. But a few of the things, the teams that I definitely look at and would want to target that Chelsea at home to Watford fixture, I think we've seen over the past couple of weeks, Watford really being a team that people have wanted to target. We saw it with Leicester at the weekend as well. So that Chelsea if you can go in on some of the Chelsea attackers, potentially, like if you could know that Lukaku was going to start, if you knew that Mount Pulisic were going to start, then I think there's some really nice differentials in there. Leicester at home to Southampton. Again, yes, they play on Thursday night, so it's a bit of a short turnaround for them. But again, if you know Madison or Vardy are going to start, I think they're great assets going into the final day of the season. Liverpool, of course, a fully rested team this evening and I expect them to go pretty full strength against Wolves to get their rhythm back up ahead of the Champions League final which is six days after the final Premier League game so I still think you know Trent Robertson will start that game a big question which a lot of people will be asking is do we think Salah is going to be available for that game do we think he's going to start my personal thought on that just to go slight tangent is I think I can't see him really being risked from the start especially given what Klopp's done in this evening's game he's obviously not that focused now on getting a Premier League title this season. And, you know, if he's taken a full week to recover from what he did at the weekend, then he's not going to risk it being the Champions League final six days after. There's no need to risk that. And, you know, him still needing six days to recover after that Wolves game and missing the final. So I think there's a good chance that he's on the bench and he could be involved, but I could, would be surprised if he starts that game. And then the bottom two fixtures on my fixture list, Man City at home to Villa, especially if Liverpool drop points today, the title looks all but sealed for Man City, even if they were to lose that game. And then Spurs away at Norwich. I think a lot of the captaincy options this week will come from that game, especially if we've got no Mo Salah. Harry Kane, Son away at Norwich will, will definitely be a team that we want to target. Now, Spurs only need a point, whereas we thought they would potentially need at least a win in yeah. this game. I still think they'll go and they'll want to make it as comfortable for themselves as they can and not, you know, be risking dropping points late with late equalizers from Norwich. I think they'll want to go and put the game to bed and they have the firepower to go and do that. I've got Son and Kulisevsky in my team and I'm even considering adding Kane on top of that. There are a few in here which, outside of sort of the big hitters that we've got, like Leicester, Liverpool, City, Spurs, that I think we'll talk about. I quite like Brentford this week. I think Arsenal, Everton is really difficult to call, depending on what happens on Thursday night for Everton, but I still think it's difficult to call there. You've got Brighton, West Ham. I think that's quite hard. I know Bowen is the most transferred in, but away at Brighton is not an easy fixture. And it's probably not where I'd be using my transfer on the final day. 
out of the lesser teams, yeah, Palace United again, I think it's a difficult game to call. Brentford is a team, I think we there are some nice differential punts in there. Again, do you echo those teams that I've called out or anyone else that stands out for you this week? I like how you snuck in United as being part of the lesser teams. <laughs> it was more that I think that game is really hard to call. To be yeah, fair. yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. So it's been so wholesome, I know what you meant. Yeah, but no, um, absolutely, you know, I, I agree with that. And I think that, um, you know, particularly I catch that Chelsea game at home to Watford. So Watford do look absolutely gone. Again, I was advised this by the Bureau, just, just go with Madison. Of course, I did not. <laughs> Stupid Tom. Anyway, um, but obviously, it's obviously contingent on that game, uh, where that goes, and the, the likes of um, Mount and uh, Lukaku maybe um, are going to be of interest to people. I think what could be quite useful, though, Harry, after you give a really good overview of just the, the kind of the game week in general, is to have a look at kind of positions, uh, players per position, and kind of players that we're tipping. Uh, one week, sort of genie in the bottle, so to speak. Well, maybe we'll speak about a few players. Maybe kind of name one or two that we're really interested in. And um, let's. let's get defenders done really quickly I think you're going to be all set here barring a big injury or something like that so Adam Pritchard who incidentally has promised that he's going to get a tattoo of Timu Puki if he scores against Spurs and stops um, them qualifying from the Champions League one to watch there he's promised this I and mean, there's those witnesses um, but he does say He's removing his injured defender this week, which is horribly boring. Who would be advocating? So he's removing Diaz. He owns Robertson and Laporte, but he's got a flagged Van Dijk who's not likely to play against Wolves, probably. He's also got kind of a non-playing player as his kind of other player. Um, so he has to make a defender transfer to get free at the back at the very least. Um, a few options out there for that. Um, my kind of personal suggestion, if you are looking at defenders and you're not troubled up on Spurs, I appreciate probably you might be if you're going to go for um, Kane, Son plus Kulisevsky, would be Sessegnon. Um, really good relationship um, to the eye test with Ben Davis on the left-hand side. It's really cool to see Ben Davis kind of motoring up there. Um, Conte referred to him as his Aspilicueta uh, kind of surrogate at, at Spurs, which was really cool. And Sessegnon at 4.3 is third for non penalty That's a goal involvement amongst defenders over the last six game weeks. So that's not too bad at all. He's performing better than the likes of Trent and Rhys James, albeit there's patchy perform appearances for those two over the last six. And he's far outperforming Emerson Royale on the opposite flank, who I still maintain is... Not stealing a living exactly, but sometimes I kind of wonder if I was a little bit fitter, I could probably play that role. <laughs> and uh, James, um, I guess, would be the other option. Always explosive and the market, as you've seen, is going that way. Um, what are your views on defenders, Harry? Don't spend too long here, but I mean, has anyone come to mind other than those two? Or would you agree with any of them? I like Sessegnon a lot and his price, I think, is very nice. And it allows, you know, if you're making a second transfer to free up money going elsewhere... I like potentially going like Rico Henry. I've spoken a little bit about Brentford. Um, there's quite a nice narrative around Brentford when, you know, that sort of rivalry they had in the championship. And when Leeds got promoted, there was a lot of beef between Leeds and Brentford mm. saying, mind the yep, gap, yep. Thomas, mind the gap, Thomas Frank. And I think that was being chanted. And I think a few of the Brentford players have dug that up. And if Brentford could give them a little helping hand back down into the championship, I think they might enjoy that quite a lot. So I like him. And the other one is, is Leicester. If, you know, it's very difficult to predict those Leicester fullbacks. But for example, if Castagna is going to start that last game at home to Southampton, I quite yeah. like that. But you do Ooh. play the lottery of, of Leicester fullbacks a little bit. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. I mean, that's a really out there sort of punty pick, isn't it, or something like that. I mean, it, it could pay off. It really could. But I think um, there you're looking at Sessegnon or something like that. I mean, if you don't have Robertson, for example, and you've got loads of money to piss around, I mean, he could be obviously one that you get in for the fun day as well against Wolves. You don't seem to be able to hit a barn door at the moment. Let's move forward to midfield. This, this is where it gets exciting. There's a few questions about this. So, Jay Mera. Wondering about Mount or Diaz for his midfield picks to replace Coutinho. He already owns Madison um, and he's between that two, between those two. Where's the big call, he asks. So Mount versus Watford. We've already kind of started talking about this a little bit. Diaz versus Wolves. Um, Chris Knoll asks if Jota is being slept on, although he did start tonight. So maybe he's being slept on for good reason if you don't own him already. Uh, Tom um, is looking at Bowen or Mount. Well, I don't know. And Dan, the FPL fan, says he's looking at Ericsson. 
Um, so um, maybe feeding into Brentford. I think maybe we should start with Brentford, actually, Harry, because I did have a look at them for this podcast, because obviously, you know, it's, it's a, a team who are of interest. Um, Brentford are playing some just nice football recently, and you know, you've got Ericsson there, um, as mentioned by Dan, of an OKXGI. I do want to mention kind of one uh, name out of the hat, who's Wissa. Um, so to, to the eye, his average position has been really advanced. So his stats aren't a lot to write home about, but what really interests me and reflects his positioning is that he's getting into attacking areas and he's shooting rather than passing. I think it's like 0.2 XA compared to over one for his XG. Nice facts on Visser as well. He's overperforming his XG by quite a long way. So he's seventh for all players this season for the disparity between expected goals and expected goals. Um, seven goals scored, 3.4 XG. Only KDB, Som, Vardy, JWP, ESR and Zaha have bettered that. And in He's in the top 10 as well for things like uh, shots in the box per 90. So um, if you're looking for like a super uber differential, I do like the look of him in that midfield. Um, although Ericsson, fun facts on Ericsson, and also will come on to Tony in the forwards. Ericsson have the second highest expected goals from set play at home this season. Only Man City have more. Yeah, I like Brentford a lot. This, uh, again, has that feels like he's got that more explosive nature about him but maybe that's just recency bias of what he did against Everton I think Ericsson is a really nice option being on set pieces as well that extra route to goals and we know how much Leeds love conceding goals from set pieces this season so I like Ericsson if I had to pick again I feel like Visa's wish has got the higher chance of hauling but I probably would go Ericsson again just feels so involved for that Brentford team everything sort of ticks through him I really like him. Again, we'll talk about Tony, who's definitely the one I would just go with. The majority of us don't have three forwards at the moment. So you are probably looking at, you have the option to go with Ericsson, Visser or Tony. And Tony just makes a lot of sense. If we were clogged up in the forward positions, then maybe you want to look at a Brentford midfielder. But yeah, as I said, because most of us are only playing one up front most of these weeks, I think Tony is still where I'd, I'd favour. I think he'll still be a good differential most weeks. Uh, I, th- I still think he'll be a good differential this week. Um, he'll be highly transferred in, but it won't be enough to sort of make him above like 20% no, own. So no, I still definitely. think Tony is where I'd go. Yeah, well, we'll get on to fours in a bit, but I, I think he'll be kind of top of mind for both of us there. But no, interesting sort of area, Brentford. There was one good point made by our friend uh, BNM Matt, um, who said that candidacy of Brentford players may hinge on the Villa and Burnley result. Because if Burnley lose, Leeds only need a draw against Brentford to stay up if other things transpire. So they could set up to part the bus. I mean, obviously, they're not the most solid team in the world, but they could set up to do that and try to restrict chances. So that could be a, a narrative, a story you could tell yourself if, you don't, if you're not too interested. But ultimately, I think they're quite nice as kind of one week sort of pocket rockets. You know, Genie, Genie in the bottle. Yeah, Johan Wisser. I got him in the last week and he absolutely smashed it. It is a possibility, uh, but more likely, I think, to be a possibility is one of the Chelsea boys. And obviously, um, looking at non pen over the course of the season, the top of that metric is in the midfield and it is uh, Lampard's golden boy, Mason Mount. And Chelsea, of course, second for its best play from goals over the last six, and they're playing Watford. I mean, I'm looking at buying Mason Mount, probably, and I'm probably looking at captaining him, Harry. I mean, do you foresee... That being, I mean, it's probably going to be the last game of the Abraham Vichera, or definitely the last game of the Abraham Vichera. Do you think that's going to be kind of a real celebration at Stamford Bridge almost, kind of a wake almost? And do you think it's going to be a, a demolition? Because it just feels like the stars are aligning that way. We're going to clearly get a 1 0 Watford win, aren't we? <laughs> Yeah, I, I will say it now that if Watford come out and win that game, I would be surprised. I, I think especially now that sort of third place, not even just Champions League, third place is secured for us as well. I'd be surprised if we didn't come out with a pretty f- free-flowing attack. Now, there is a chance that we get Pulisic, Ziyech, Havertz, Werner, Lukaku, any of them could start. I think Mount is the safest, right? I would see who starts against Leicester and try and hedge your bets because I reckon they'll all get minutes between now and the end of the season. So it may depend on who starts in that Leicester game. But if you are looking at a game, if you think I'm going to put a banker on one game ending like four or five nil, potentially, you'd probably pick that Chelsea Watford game. Mount is the one I'd go with because I'm a bit of a boring and safe manager like that. Again, if I was chasing, I'd maybe look at like Ziyech or Pulisic, particularly if he doesn't start. Um, But I imagine he will play against Leicester. So Mount is probably where I'd go. But again, I think there's a lot of nice differential forwards. I think the midfielders are 
nice, but they're not necessarily as trustworthy as maybe some of the forwards I'd quite like to have. And we'll talk about Lukaku Ooh. once we go on to the forwards. I think there's real opportunity if you're on a free hit this week to go sort of three up front with the amount of nice forwards there are this week. Lukaku, for example, again, again, we'll talk about. I like Mount, though. He's reliable. He's done it over the past sort of 10 weeks quite consistent, quite consistently as well. I mean, the forwards have hardly been very reliable over the course of the season, so you can no. see why people are going to be reticent to go there. But that's a valid point. I mean, we, we really need to we really need to mention Jared Bowen here, though. I mean, I know earlier on you said you're a bit iffy about that. Um, but you know, West Ham need to beat Brighton. And if United don't if Man United don't win against Crystal Palace, which given how they've been performing is a distinct possibility, um, they're gonna get the Europa League and Palace will be and uh, United, sorry, will be consigned to the Europa Conference League, as I believe it's called. Uh, Bowen this season, so if you if you factor in that he's highly ex motivated, Bowen this season, he's scored over 200 points now. He's just one got one goal or assist shy of 30 goal involvements this season. It's simply sensational out of nowhere. I mean, I, I hate the phrase, but as you kind of third earlier we've all slept on him over the last few weeks as we lusted after double game week chumps he scored 33 points in his last three game weeks and the one thing i would point out though bowen even though i like him a lot and he's like to the eye he's he's a really really good footballer and decent finisher he's got 2.8 um xgi over the last six game weeks but five involvement so he's overperforming a little bit and um, I know he's kind of been in the Premier League for a little while but we haven't got the, the kind of length of data to know whether he's overperforming kind of habitually or it's just kind of one season but you no know, 141 points last season 204 and counting this season um, and next year could be really interesting unless of course he gets bought for Liverpool and he's in the rotation there. Yeah, I like Bowen and I think he's, you know, as we saw against Manchester, he's capable of scoring one, if not two, because of the way West Ham play now with Antonio not really running in behind and it being Bowen, he's capable of doing it. We do know Brighton are quite a good team defensively, especially when they set up nicely at home. I don't see West Ham going and putting two or three past Brighton again. I may be proved wrong, but again, if I'm looking for an explosive player in the final week, he's just... I'm not sure Bowen this week is where I'd go, although he just did it against Manchester City. And if he did it against Man City, there's no reason he can't do it against Brighton. So I could be proved wrong. And if I was on a free hit, then maybe he'd be one of my five midfielders. But he don't doesn't feel like a priority up at the top of the list for me. No, fair enough. Else, elsewhere at his, at his price, again, we spoke a little bit about Liverpool earlier. And now Jota did start tonight. Um, so that, to me, means... Luis Diaz becomes a particularly nice option looking at the weekend's fixture against Wolves. Um, he's looked so good since he came into the Premier League. When I saw Jota start for Liverpool, the way he came in, I thought they'll do well to sign a player that hits the ground running better than him, yet they seem to have one-upped him with the way Luis Diaz has started the season. He seems to be able to run and run. He's finishing really well. He's very involved both with goals and assists as well. So, He'd probably be my number one if I was looking for an explosive midfielder to buy this week. I think Luis Diaz would would be it if you didn't have the money for a you know a son, for example, if you didn't own him. Down at those mid-priced options, Wolves are conceding goals. I think we've spoken a lot about in the season about being good defensively, but over the sort of past five weeks, they've conceded a fair few chances and a fair few goals to go with it. So I do think Luis Diaz, final home game of the season, we spoke about as you said, home team scoring extra goals not so much away team. So I like him. He'd probably be the number one midfielder that I would go with this week. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, he's averaging seven points per game at the moment, which is frankly great. <laughs> I mean, obviously, obviously to the eye as well. It's it's very difficult to see past him. And you, you've got to you've got to think the Wolves, especially now, I mean, obviously on the beach is a subjective phrase we acknowledged a few weeks ago. But it feels like with them, they are, more than capable of just kind of rolling over to Liverpool. And I've got memories of, you know, Liverpool doing them two or three nil on the final day of the season. It always seems to be Sadio Mane in my mind, um, scoring the goals on the final day against Wolves. Uh, Luis Diaz could be obviously a very interesting player to bring in, especially 8.1. Um, I think that would be interesting. It's just whether that's going to be the explosive one that we're looking for, Harry. That's the only yeah but about Diaz. It would be for me, I'd be probably looking at Mount. Could you kind of even fathom the likes of Captain America or ZH or something like that? No, that's just too far. But you know what I mean? I feel like that, that Watford game with you 
I mean, obviously, we'll come on to strikers in a minute. It sounds like that's where you're warmer to Chelsea. But of the midfield, I think that Mount's the one that I'm kind of the most interested in, especially if I'm going to be kind of going outside of the safety. Um, we'll speak about Spurs in just a second, but going outside of that safety zone and captaining elsewhere. I think that'll be the that, that'll be kind of the place I go for that sort of explosive differential right now um, in answer to, uh, to Jai's question. Yeah, I, I, again, I like Mount. I think... <sighs> I've seen enough, and as a Chelsea fan, I often stay away from our assets a little bit because <laughs> I'm a bit of a pessimistic fan when it comes to that sort of buying into an FPL point of view. Again, we've seen enough times, you know, Mount has been involved. Does he always get returns? Not always. He's also capable of hauling at the other end. I, I think Diaz and Mount are both very nice picks, and they have very nice fixtures this week. There's not that much to pick between them. I'm slightly favouring Diaz. It sounds like you're slightly favouring Mount. It could go either way on the final day, but given their prices as well, it's fairly easy for a lot of us to go and get to them, especially with Salah being out, the money that Salah frees up. It's fairly straightforward for people to be getting to at least one of those guys. I'm looking at both of them, particularly Diaz as a sort of Salah replacement because I free hit this week. So I still have Salah sat in my team, um, but Diaz I do particularly like. But yeah, if, if I knew Pulisic was going to start, I'd go with him. But there's enough doubt in my mind about that. Yeah, for sure. I strongly advise everybody to go against what I do. That's kind of just, just it feels like the watchword for this season. Just just go the opposite way to Tom and you'll be absolutely fine. So that me, I'm kind of looking through you kind of you've got one way you can go uh, which is to like some sort of like heaven and the other place is the hell always oh, i'm not going down the hell path it's incredibly annoying harry but it sounds like yeah we're kind of homing in on diaz and mount uh joining sessignon as being kind of the, the kind of the main sort of ones that we're tipping here for the one week's sort of output um Move forward to the strikers then. A few kind of names kind of moving around. So Barat mentioned that he's looking at bringing in Vardy um, as a result um, of selling Salah uh, this week. So as with you, he's still got Salah. He's come back from a free hit. And I'm looking at Tony, as is Dan, the FPL fan, who earlier on mentioned Ericsson as well. So obviously I like Tony a lot. Um, he's actually 18th um, for non pen SGI this season, which is really good for a newly promoted striker. And he's surprisingly best than the likes of Trent, Bernardo and Madison. Obviously, there's an element of talisman theory involved there and um, that he's kind of the man um, that everything's going to be revolving around. And he's fifth for non pen SGI over the last six game weeks on forwards, which isn't actually that great if you think about it because forwards are absolutely terrible. Um, but he'd be the one that I'm very interested in, especially with that kind of set pieces stat that I mentioned earlier on in terms of uh, what he can do um, and how uh, Brentford through Ericsson can generate um, those set piece uh, sort of chances, which uh, seems to be very, very good at this season. So, I mean, I've got Richarlison, um to either keep or move on. I mean, I, I think that we, Arsenal, we haven't spoken about us at all um, so thus far so we'll come on to Spurs just a bit in the captaincy um, but I, I think that we are still aghast at the moment they're just very disappointing with the Spurs result for one but the Newcastle kind of reaction was even worse I've been lamenting that more than my FPL season if I'm honest um, but like I, I just kind of feel like I'd be I just, I just, I, I don't know. I, I could easily just kind of keep Richarlison and expect to return something <laughs> to be honest in that game yeah. um, I think a lot I have Richarlison as well and I'm considering what to do with him you know I could do like an upgrade of him I think a lot will depend on what they get in the final game of the season so if they sorry in on Thursday night if they get anything against Palace then I think Richarlison and their motivation going into the final day will have dropped they might look at it as a sort of celebration of staying up if they go and win that game against Palace but equally their motivation might not be there as much. And then I, I may want to move on with Charleston for someone who's focusing a little bit more in that final game. Two, you've spoken about, Tony. I said I was going to come back to again. I really like that as an option. There are a lot of set pieces conceded for Leeds, goals conceded from set pieces. Tony has done a fair few of goals from set pieces this season. He's also mm. on penalties as well. He's their main goal threat I can see a fair few goals and that leads as you said if they only need a point they might set up a little bit defensively but Leeds are not a team at the moment that seem capable of winning a game one nil or drawing it nil nil it feels like I'm going to try and outscore you it doesn't feel like there's going to be really low scoring games um, with Leeds and particularly with the way Brentford are pretty free scoring at the moment I would probably expect a fair few goals in that one so I like Tony is really cheap as well. So a lot of us like with Pookie, for example, or Richarlison or Ings or Watkins trying to move them on. Tony at that sort of price is, is really nice. It makes a lot of sense. Vardy is a lot more expensive. But again, if I, if I had the choice, I'd probably go Vardy over 
over Tony. It's just the amount of money that you have to have to free up. Home to Southampton again. Southampton have looked like the team that has been on the beach for the past month or so. Leicester against Watford and against Norwich have been, you know, for so free scoring, scored five at the weekend, put three past Norwich. Again, you can definitely see Vardy wanting to finish the season on a high. And I think that's a really nice fixture for them to do it. However, if you have the money for Jamie Vardy, there are a couple of names which then start to creep into our minds. Vardy's great, but then you also have the competition of Harry Kane and Romeo Lukaku in there as well. Kane will be the most highly owned out of the three, but away at Norwich, most of us will own Son. And that's, again, we'll talk about captaincy in a minute. I really like Lukaku at home to Watford. Now, it may depend on Havertz's fitness and Havertz's injury. I think if Havertz is fit, then I wouldn't go near him because Tuchel has really trusted Havertz this season and what he's been capable of doing. And it's not completely out of the question that he gives him the start on the final day just to reward him for what he has done. If they're both fit, one starting Leicester, one starting Watford is very possible. But if we knew Lukaku was going to start, the way he seems to be finishing at the moment, a lot more confidence in the way he's playing. I like that one. If you had the money for what any forward, if you were looking at Lukaku, Vardy and Harry Kane, which which would you be backing? I'm probably just about on Lukaku if I thought he was going to start. I think I I'd, I'd, I would be very interested in that as well, just because of the explosiveness. But I mean, I, I think maybe it's a bit churlish to be kind of saying, oh yeah, I, I definitely back Lukaku when you've got Harry Kane against an abject Norwich. <laughs> I mean, I, I, obviously you're coming at it from the perspective of a son owner at the moment who needs to do a bit of a manoeuvring to get Kane in to some extent. Um, yeah. But it'd be very difficult for me to be looking at that game week for what it's worth and kind of thinking to myself, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to back if I had the choice between Kane and Lukaku to go with Lukaku, kind of, it just feels like it, it's the, the kind of game, especially thinking about kind of years past the Vares game, 7-1 against Hull that I mentioned earlier on, that Kane really goes off in. <laughs> and, and it just, it, it definitely would feel to me um, a bit worrying to go with Lukaku. I, I wouldn't mind pairing Kane and Lukaku if I had a free kit, mind you. I think that that would be potentially incredibly differential and incredibly cool uh, to do. Yeah. Kane is much more of that safer sort of trusted pick. And the only concern for me is Norwich played, I think a five at the back against um, at the weekend. And they were slightly more difficult to break down. And we have seen at points this season, Spurs struggle. They did it against Burnley. They struggled a little bit to break it down. Although Norwich don't quite have the defensive power that, that Burnley are capable of putting up. So it's a really tough call. Vardy has shown in recent weeks what he's doing. Lukaku is the big differential, I suppose, out of those three. He'll be the, the lowest, lowest owned out of the three. Again, if you've already got Son and you want to maybe look elsewhere, if he's going to be your captain, then I do like Lukaku. But as you say, Kane away at Norwich is definitely maybe too, too good to look past, I think, there. But Tony, again, as we keep going back to, I'm not really sure it's worth spending on, on any of these guys over, over Tony. And I think... I do really like him. If you're just looking for a, a forward, a Richarlison replacement, which a lot of people will be doing, I think Tony is a really, really nice shout for this weekend. What, what about late risers man Timo Werner though, Harry? I mean, he's only got 10 goals to make up over the course of his Chelsea career. If you look at his actual versus expected. So maybe it will come in one game. 10 goals against Watford. <laughs> He used no. up all of his. He used up all of his good luck about three weeks ago, and then yeah. hasn't done anything since. No, I'm not going to lie. Like, not much is popping in the data when you see that Pookie and Welbeck have the most big chances. You know that the forwards are in trouble. I mean, be, I, I like if he was looking. I mean, he's got a two. He's got a goal in the last two games. If Antonio's data was looking anywhere near decent, I'd be having a look at him for the same reason I mentioned Bowen, but it's not quite there with him. And the pen box touches, especially an average positioning is just ridiculous for Antonio. So I, was, I thought, oh, that could be really interesting, you know, and have that circularity to the season. You start with Antonio going mad. Could it happen the last game week of the season? It just doesn't look at the moment like the data's really there, but you know, it's, it's one week genie punt, who knows? But I mean, it sounds like for us, you know, we're looking at kind of Sessegnon in midfield, Mount or Diaz in midfield, uh, sorry, Sessegnon in defence, Mount or Diaz in midfield, and probably uh, Tony up front, but a luxury pick of Lukaku if possible. But I think probably we'd be saying as well, don't 
overlook Kane <laughs> in that situation. Um, and it's worth kind of moving on to captaincies as well then quickly, just because, I mean, uh, we'll obviously do our chances and captains in a bit, but probably worth kind of adding more voice to it this week rather than just saying I'm captaining this guy and left, leaving it implicit. Um, I think the, you know, the safety this week is going to be Son, isn't it, Harry? I mean, over 100% EO this week just gone, despite only having one game in the top 10K. I don't know whether that's because of laziness or because Salah's out of the equation and people just kind of lumped on Son. Um, but Salah out the equation, I think Son's going to be kind of the, the easy kind of mass pick defensive captain, isn't he? Yeah, and I think given that Salah injury, the most obvious transfer a lot of people have had all season is that Salah to Son move. So I think Salah, sorry, I think Son and Kane combined will have massive ownership. Son particularly, I can see him sort of going... 140% plus this week, given he's playing Norwich at home. And he only needs one goal if Salah doesn't play to get that golden boot as well. So a little extra incentive and we've yeah. had a big debate about whether Kane hands over penalties to Son, which it seems very unlikely. Um, but that little extra motivation potentially for Son of the golden boot, again, it makes him the clear standout. He'll be my captain this week. I can't see me going elsewhere. If you are chasing, I think there are plenty of options that you could go with, but for the safety pick, I think, yeah, Son will be where it is this week, especially given I don't think Salah will start at the weekend. Yeah, certainly. As I said, I mean, given where I am, I'd be looking at bringing in kind of likes of Mount or something like that and captioning them, but I wouldn't advise that in any other situation, I think. I think if you're kind of, say Harry, say Harry, you're at a situation where you're, I don't know. I know but our friend um, JP, he's uh, you know, number two in his country and he's like 15 points off the top. Would captaincy be a place you would punt? Uh, he's doing, I think he's in the top 10K. Or would you still be saying, you know, captain son and kind of let your team do the talking? Would captaincy this week be one that you'd risk? Probably not because. I look at that Spurs game and I think they could score four against Norwich and Son could easily score twice. And I don't see anyone I'm as sure of scoring points. Now, you may want to go with Kane over Son and hope that you get on the day that it's Kane that gets all the points instead of Son. I don't think that's likely. I don't think captaincy is really where I'd, pick, I'd want to pick my back to as if I was only sort of 10 or 15 points behind. I'd let yeah. the rest of my team do the poor do the do the talking if i was sort of 20 25 30 points behind and you really need to chase it that's when i'd look away from son or kane but for the time being i think those two it's just a standout fixture the ones we've spoken about is where i would look i'd go you know lukaku if we thought he was potentially going to start again mount in midfield Vardy, Madison, those sorts of players that we have spoken about, Kane if you don't have him, and even Kevin De Bruyne although Aston Villa have been a bit more assured defensively over the past sort of month or so, so maybe not there but again, you'd probably expect Man City to put a few goals past them even on their day so the ones I'd look at as a differential would, yeah, Lukaku, Mount, Vardy Madison, Kane if you do want to go past Son Cool, all right Cool. Um, just one couple, a couple more things to talk about. Um, the first one, as we've got to mention every year, of is the twist. It's kind of the leaker sort of thing that goes on. Probably just a quick one for the Twitter crowd. I mean, it's a notorious time for pranksters and chain yankers, <laughs> and um, it's it's definitely one that you'll kind of see kind of bits and pieces, tidbits, even if you're not on Twitter, you'll probably see it flashed across your socials that you've heard that someone's not playing or someone is playing. And you know, a couple of years ago, there was a famous situation where um, Salah and Trent were both rotated surprisingly. Um, and we only got that news kind of at the deadline. Um, I mean, what's your approach? Um, just go over it briefly. And I'm sure I agree. I'll agree hundred um, percent. What checks do you do on leakers and things like that to, to kind of ensure that, there, the sort of thing that you're going to be acting on. Like, what do you need to reassure you that, okay, I'm confident here that I'm, this is legit? I think I need to have trusted them and seen it work throughout the season, not just on the final day. There'll be plenty of people who come out of the woodwork on the final day to try and give that extra bit of news. And if they haven't had, you know, leaks between game week one and game week 37, it's very, very unlikely that they suddenly have it for game week 38. So someone that I've trusted throughout the season that potentially is going to get early news, like we have with Leicester, for example, Sam Martin, if that was spoken about, then potentially I'd look there. But generally, I think we potentially get Liverpool early, although we've had errors with that in the past as well. I think given that the deadline is slightly earlier, again, an hour and a half before it, unlike we've had in past seasons, 
there's not very much that can be put in front of me that I'll really go and believe hook, line and sinker. Anyway, potentially we know Leicester and there are a few Spurs pages as well that I've trusted throughout the season. But unless they've done it for 37 game weeks gone, then I'm not really going to pay too much of attention because we know there'll be plenty of things that are not true going on to the final day. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. So, all in all, before we move on to transfers and captains in the very end, Harry, like, how do you expect um, game week 38 to go? Um, I mean, do you think it's going to be a goal fest, uncontrolled mayhem, or just hoping for a decent afternoon's viewing? I mean, you're going to be at Chelsea as well. Does that not kind of heighten your thinking that you could kind of bat on the players and get the extra sort of incentive to cheer? Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of goals looking at some of the fixtures we've got here. I don't look at them and think there's many games which I expect to be cagey affairs, maybe Brighton, West Ham and Burnley, Newcastle. The rest of them, I think there's capable of being sort of two or three plus goals in them. Yes, I will be at Chelsea. And yes, I will be having to check my phone during the game with notifications to see how my FPL team is getting on. It's not something I would do if Chelsea were fighting for Champions League on the final day, but given it's comfortable, I will have notifications up to see how my game week is going. Um, But yeah, I may look at Mason Mount, for example, if I think he's going to start again, because I'm going, but I do already have James and Alonso in my team for game week 38. So I don't plan on buying too much more into them. Yeah, I expect there to be a fair few goals looking at the fixtures we've got, not just because it's the final day, but also because how the fixtures have fallen as well. Absolutely. I mean, I'll be at um, FPL meets um, and you'll be coming as well after the Chelsea game, won't you? Yeah. Um, so this is in London. I'm so sorry if that's geographically impossible for some of you, um, but that's being held on Sunday, I think from 1 p.m., um, something like that. At FPL meets, uh, mainly I uh, pioneered by uh, FPL Nima, who's been on the pod before, but loads of us like Harry and, and I are in this sort of OG group there. Um, but yeah, but we've been meeting up throughout the course of the season, um, kind of every month month or so something like that i think christopher's in uh, by london bridge it should be a really really good event if you do want to come along and celebrate or commiserate the end of the season i'll be celebrating it for damn sure from 1 p.m um, at fpl meets on twitter if you want to try to get involved with that and do come along especially if you're coming alone that's absolutely fine like just come and find you might know, know what i look like you might know what a few people look like and um, just come and find one of us and i promise we'll kind of get you chatting and kind of get you into it and at the end of the day you know fpl is a common language so uh, you'll have a really really good time if you do go uh, if while we're on the subject of socials, I should probably say before we move on to transfers and captains, uh, game week 39 um, at Benny Blanco underscore Benny underscore Blanco 40. Change your bloody at man. Um, North versus South of G with GW39 the coat UK. Um, this is being held on Saturday 28th. A team of FPL individuals from the North and well, sort of from the North. I think there's a few Southerners on the team and the South uh, playing each other in, in 11 versus 11. Uh, Harry's playing. Um, James and Sudge from Planet FPL are playing. A friend of the pod Adam Pritchard's playing and loads of other people are playing as well. It should be excellent. It's in Birmingham, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but it should be really, really good. And um, if you want to go yeah. along, uh, do check that out. And yeah, it should be a good event, shouldn't it, Harry? I can't make it just a family wedding, sadly, because I'd be there with bells on. But yeah, I'm bet you're looking forward to that one. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. We had a training session at the weekend for the South team and there are some quality footballers on our team as well. So yeah, looking forward to it. I'm not sure how my fitness is going to hold up, but it'll be a good day and then uh, evening as well afterwards excellent enjoy the sights and sounds of birmingham so thanks right transfers and captains let's see how we are set up and harry you said you're sporting the fire at the back and here you are sporting the fire at the back but you know, you've got james you've got alonzo that could be an absolute party you've got the captain on son at the moment um double liverpool i mean this is a pretty good team isn't it i mean what are you looking at doing here yeah, I, I like it a lot. It sounds like Schmeichel is going to be fine to start that game from what we're hearing. Again, there was that whole thing of how many games is he going to play? Then there was an injury. So is he going to start both? It sounds like he's going to play both between now and the end of the season. Robertson, Trent in there. James Cancelo, Alonso, very happy with that. Son and Kulisevsky in there. Kulisevsky is an interesting one. Not that happy with him, but there's no chance I sell him against Norwich, but he hasn't been that involved. Saka in midfield again and then Salah and Rich Allison. One of the questions we had was around hits going into the final week and it's not something I particularly love taking. Again, I like having a hit that can pay off over sort of three or four game weeks. Trying to get that payback in one game week is not something I really like, which part of me then wants Everton to lose on Thursday night so that Richarlison still got something to play for so I can just keep him 
And then it's a simple move of Salah to someone else. There are a couple of other things that I could do. I could just do Richarlison to, to Tony, for example, and then Salah to an expensive one. The one I'm really looking at the moment is Salah downgraded to either Foden, Madison or Mason Mount or Diaz, one of those four. And then that frees me up money to do Richarlison basically to any forward. So I could go, you know, Lukaku if I didn't go Mount. I could go Vardy. I could go... Uh, Harry Kane as well so a lot of it revolves around what happens to Everton do I want Richarlison on the final day and then I don't think I'll be keeping Salah because I just don't think he'll start going in that Wolves game so a lot still to play seeing what happens on Thursday and in the press conferences I'll leave transfers very late but Salah and Richarlison are the two players that could potentially leave my team barring any crazy injuries. Cool. Yeah. Um, in terms of that hit question, which was from Barrett, um, I guess it depends on what you're playing for. I mean, for you, yeah, definitely makes sense to consolidate. I'm obviously going for the one shot here, so I'm far more open to the hit. I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do. Um, I'm decently-ish set up this week, but I'm also sporting the five in the back. Um, I do think Saka is gassed, and I think we've lost our mojo muchly, so he could be the one who makes way for Mount. In fact, I'm fairly sure he will be, um, just because I've got Zaha versus Man United, which should be an easy game, and uh, Son away at Norwich. Um, And I don't know, if Zaha does annoy me, um, maybe I'll remove him for Bowen, but I suspect I'll probably keep him. I've got Marcelli and Gordon, the other kind of midfielders, so it's, it's quite difficult there. I've got kind of Richarlison to play with as a forward sort of spot. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure. As I said, I'll try, there's no case I can make for Antonio other than could have motivation um, or it'd be someone like you know, Timo Werner or something like that. So it's, it's definitely kind of a fully punty spot if I go for that strike or I could just leave Richard and not take the hit. But at this point, who cares, to be honest? Um, and um, I could even go Kaku to Richard and Saka down to like a 4.4 or something like that. I mean, even that's in scope. I'm not sure what I'll do yet. Um, but um, it's, it'll see how mad I'm feeling at the time. Basically, that's kind of where this season has ended up for me. Right, that's a lot for the past but time this season. Yeah, thank you all for listening. Good luck in the second half of game week 37. I'm hoping for Ings to finally get something because he is my captain this week. Good luck for game week 38. We were who got the assist. Thank you all for listening. Please do remember if you are on YouTube to hit that subscribe button as well. Yep, thanks for listening. Back one evening next week uh, to put a button on this season and kind of doing... I guess the podcast reflecting, do I have to, on how the season has gone alongside kind of nominating some players and teams for end of season awards as we do every year. Enjoy the rest of Double Game Week 37 and the final day and we'll speak to you very, very soon. Goodbye.